Good afternoon. I am honored to be with you today at this gathering of women and girls who make a difference, not only in your lives, but in the lives of your community, and who since your founding in 1996 provide a model for others to follow, to help transcend the barriers of race and class. Thank you, Chester County Fund for Women and Girls for all you do, especially Executive Director Michelle Legaspi Sanchez and Board Chair Judy Bell. Let me add my congratulations to this year's winner of the prestigious Kitchen Table Award, Patricia Yoder. I am also honored to be even virtually on the ground where Frederick Douglass, a black male feminist walked and Harriet Tubman, the woman they called Moses, led hundreds of slaves to freedom on the Underground Railroad with the support of white abolitionists. Thinking about the connections between the suffrage and civil rights movements and social justice and human rights movements today brought me to the theme of today's talk, vision, voice, valor, and victory. I'd like for you to remember at least three things. Don't worry, I'll remind you. One, we can build on the mighty history of women's courage and accomplishments. Women have the right stuff. Let hope and commitment be our wings. Two, women of all races must work together for women's rights and racial justice, equality for all. Three, democracy is not a spectator sport. Stay informed, stay engaged, stay committed to a world where, that we know is possible. Continue to make a difference. The women pictured on today's luncheon materials are a constellation of courage, of valor. To mention a few, the youngest, Malala Yousafzai, was only 17 when she became the youngest Nobel Peace Prize recipient for her impassioned advocacy of education for girls in her native Pakistan. There's a photo of her online holding the diary of Anne Frank, the young Jewish girl whose life reminds us about the indomitable human spirit. She died in a concentration camp just before liberation. The very first play I ever saw was the diary of Anne Frank, and it helped shape my life's commitment to justice for all people. Malala was just a child when the Taliban shot her in the face for the crime of wanting to become educated. She survived and she is a human rights leader. Among the people I pray for every day is Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg, the notorious and righteous RBG. Ida B. Wells Barnett, boldly went where few had gone before. A pioneering journalist, she put herself in harm's way to personally investigate lynchings. Lest we forget, there was a time when lynchings of black people, men, women, and children were not considered crimes. I love what history and facts teach us. Having grown up in Erie, Pennsylvania, with the good fortune of attending excellent public schools, I studied about the Declaration of Independence, the Constitution, the Bill of Rights. I memorized Lincoln's Gettysburg Address. Recently, I became acquainted with the story of Mrs. Powell. According to the Friends of Franklin website, at the close of America's Constitutional Convention in 1787, Benjamin Franklin was reportedly asked by George Washington's friend, Mrs. Elizabeth Powell of Philadelphia, well, doctor, what have we got? A republic or a monarchy? Franklin responded, a republic, madam, if we can keep it. Our still relatively young republic is far from a perfect union, but the suffrage and civil and human rights movements have helped close the gap 
between ideals and reality to, as the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King said, bend the arc of the universe toward justice. It is amazing to me that such a simple notion, equality for women, could be considered controversial or threatening. Susan B. Anthony said, failure is impossible. She and Elizabeth Cady Stanton formed the National American Women's Suffrage Association. Their publication, The Revolution, had the motto, men their rights and nothing more, women their rights and nothing less. The information about Anthony is from Wesleyan University. I adapted the following from one of Divided Sisters, Bridging the Gap Between Black and White Women by Midge Wilson and Kathy Russell on pbs.org about the Seneca Falls Convention, which was in July of 1848 and brought together 200 women and 40 men, including feminists Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Lucretia Mott to make the claim for full citizenship. It was at Seneca Falls that the suffrage movement began. As the movement progressed, white and black women fought among and between themselves over the best course of action. Sojourner Truth, who had already experienced her own personal struggle toward freedom from slavery, remained unwavering in her support of women's rights. During the last quarter of the 19th century, white and black women encouraged separate black and white unions, but at least one white woman, Amelia Bloomer, was having none of that. She campaigned against racism within the women's movement and some black people did rise to positions of prominence. When Ida B. Wells Barnett, the journalist who had led the anti-lynching campaign in the late 19th century, and who, by the way, was just awarded a posthumous Pulitzer Prize, brought members with her to the 1913 suffrage parade in Washington, D.C., the march organizers asked that black women walk at the end of the parade. Wells Barnett refused to march, but as the parade progressed, she joined and marched between two white supporters. Yes, there are some ceilings you need to break, some fences you need to climb, some systems you need to change. When I was growing up in Erie in the 50s and 60s, we were taught little about women's history and almost nothing about black history. We were acquainted with names of a few great women like Anthony and Stanton, but the information was filtered through a white male lens I had forgotten or maybe did not know that Susan B. Anthony had been arrested and tried in criminal court for voting illegally. She used that platform to give a public lecture on women's rights. When the judge tried to silence her, she persisted. Although she lost the case, she gained in her voice and she planted a seed that later grew into the 19th Amendment. Sojourner Truth was reported to have said, ain't I a woman? I say reported because that great visionary, a former slave, had been denied the opportunity to learn to read and write. But she had a phenomenal memory and gave speeches without notes or other tools that most of us cannot function without. Others wrote her story, and there are some suspicions that someone slipped in ain't to be more colloquial or dramatic. Through her almost century of life, which spanned from pre-Civil War 1797 to 1883, what we do know is that she spoke at the Women's Rights Convention in Akron, Ohio in 1851, and what she said was powerful. She had agency and voice. She had the audacity to stand up and speak truth pun intended, to power. The NAACP, the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, grew out of a response by white liberals, including Mary White Ovington, to anti-black violence in Springfield, Illinois. 
the birthplace of Abraham Lincoln. Founded in 1909, the NAACP is the nation's foremost, largest, and most widely respected civil rights organization. At that meeting, they issued a call to discuss racial justice. Some 60 people, seven of whom were African Americans, including W.E.B. Du Bois and Ida B. Wells Barnett, signed the call, which was released on the centennial of Lincoln's birth. The NAACP founders were transitional figures. Another transitional figure was Eleanor Roosevelt. A key moment was when she championed Marian Anderson to sing at the White House in 1935. Then on Easter Sunday in 1939 at the Lincoln Memorial. The daughters of the American Revolution had refused to allow Miss Anderson to sing at Constitution Hall because of her race. Now blacks and whites had intergenerational involvement also in the civil rights movement. An intergenerational example is the Little Rock Nine, nine teenagers who bravely integrated Central High School in Little Rock, Arkansas, under the guidance of the NAACP president, Daisy Bates. Let me add how brave they and their families were. One of the nine was 15-year-old Elizabeth Eckford who walked alone and without police and National Guard protection. She was viciously taunted and spat upon by adults and children who fought integration. She represents thousands of others, all of whom, most of whom are nameless, who endured attack dogs and fire hoses to demand the opportunity for equal education. Most people know of the name of Rosa Parks who refused to move to the back of a segregated bus and whose arrest sparked the Montgomery bus boycott. Mrs. Park sat down to stand up. Mississippi sharecropper and leader Fannie Lou Hamer had no money, but what she had was passion and a powerful voice. That women were not permitted to speak from the main stage at the March on Washington demonstrates why black women need to be advocates of women's rights as well as civil rights. The civil and human rights pioneers paved the way for other African-American women, such as Shirley Chisholm, the first black woman elected to Congress, and in 1972, the first to run for president of a major party. And of course, C. Dolores Tucker, who was Pennsylvania's Secretary of State in the 1980s, 1970s, excuse me. Today, we celebrate leaders here and abroad. Women have led the fight for the equal rights movement. Thank you, Pennsylvania, for becoming the 38th state to ratify. Young leaders are giving us hope and wisdom beyond their years. 11-year-old Naomi Wadler spoke at the 2018 March for Our Lives for all the African-American girls left out of the gun violence discussion. Teenager Greta Thunberg took on climate change and the world politicians who persist in ignoring it. There are the women, young and old, of the Me Too movement. And then there are the women of the Chester County Fund for Women and Girls. Another transitional figure is Speaker of the United States House of Representatives, Nancy Pelosi, probably the most powerful woman in American history until we finally get a woman president. I promised that I would remind you of three major takeaways from my talk today. One, we can build on the mighty history of women's courage and accomplishments. Women have the right stuff. Let hope and commitment be our wings. Two, women of all races must work together for women's rights and racial justice, equality for all. Three, democracy is not a spectator sport. Stay informed, stay engaged, stay committed to a world that we know is possible. Continue to make a difference. 
So, in the spirit of Susan B. Anthony, Harriet Tubman, Rosa Parks, Elizabeth Eckford, Shirley Chisholm, Malala Yousafzai, and Greta Thunberg, amplify your blueprint into a national call for action for an overground railroad, a contemporary walk toward freedom. None of us is free until we all are free. Hold on to your vision, raise your voice, be steadfast in valor and march on to victory. Working together, failure is impossible. Thank you. Hi, Dr. Bell. Hi, how are you? We're doing well, thank you. Great program. I'm really enjoying listening to the uh, wonderful words, seeing the great people, and hearing the wonderful singing. My goodness. <laughs> Thanks, Dr. Bell. Um, so uh, here's your first question. It's been a tough week for our country. And during a time of crisis like this, what gives you hope? What gives me hope is the, the people who have responded in a positive manner. I think protests are positive. And I think that the fact that you have people of all races and all ages participating, is that, that gives me hope. Can you hear me? We can, yes. Thank you, Dr. Bell. I can definitely hear you. Yeah, so no, I, I'm, I am hopeful because of the peaceful response. There are always people who want to be um, instigators and do things that detract from the overall positive nature of it. But I think people are, are very, they want to do the right thing. I've always said that, that, that the, to me, the values of American society, we really believe in fair play. We don't always have the, the answers of how to get there. But I think that people have opened their eyes and, they're, and they are making personal commitment to move forward. And that gives me hope. I'm always hopeful anyway, because I really believe, as Brian Stevenson says, hopelessness is the enemy of social justice. I've been hopeful all my life. That's why I keep moving forward. Thank you. Thank you. And hopefully we can all, hopefully, all keep those same sentiments within each and every one of us, too. So thank yes. you for that. Yes. All right. So considering the current social political climate, what can the fund and its supporters do starting today to bring about the much needed gender and racial progress we seek? Well, you have such a great foundation and I'm not intimately aware with everything that you do, but I know you believe in intergenerational work and, uh, and have, um, have supported girls as, as well as, I mean, I love the, the kitchen table award winner uh, background and everything. I think that what, they, what you can do today if you've not, you may have done it already, is to really encourage people to be civically active. And for those who are 18 years of age and older, to vote, because voting to me is foundational in terms of a democracy. And we need to vote because and voting, people who tell me they don't vote, they drive me a little crazy, because I'll, what I say is people die for our right to vote. We have to honor their sacrifice and we have to build on a country that has so many promises for us all. Thank you. Um, so here's another question for you. Which women or which woman do you personally admire today, woman or women, and why? I have such a long list, but I'll, I'll just give you a couple of them. One is Gloria Steinem. She's uh, been a friend of mine for about 40 years. She was my first editor uh, when I submitted an article to Ms. Magazine. And Gloria Steinem is always on the right side of justice. She and I don't agree on everything, but she has really worked toward what we're talking about today, both women and racial equality. So I, I think that she is just um, phenomenal um, and I admire her very, very much. I also admire um, Barbara Lee, Congresswoman Barbara Lee from uh, California, 
who is who has worked for peace and justice all her life, and uh, who who is not afraid to speak up and to be a majority of one when it is necessary. So those are a couple of the people that I admire greatly. And of course, uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, how can you not? Of course, who can't admire her? And of course, Gloria Steinem as well. Well, thank you, Dr. Bell. Um, we've really appreciated this opportunity to have this Q&A. We wish there were time for more questions as well as wishing you were here with us. Is there any just some final one word that you'd like to um, leave with our audience before we move on to the next segment? Simply, I'd like to repeat at the end of what my prepared remarks were. And I and I know you get it because I can see from the energy and the, the, the programs that you have, but working together, really, failure is impossible. Thank you, Dr. Bell. Everyone really appreciates all your words and comments. Thank you so, so much.